Well, we're blessed, uh, blessed to be with you today. Um, welcome, welcome Victorville, welcome to other campuses and to our online audience. Once again, just want you all to know that we're, we're uh, overwhelmed that you'll spend some of your, your weekend with us. Uh, got a word from the Lord, doesn't happen often. Uh, this directly and this powerfully and this audibly. So I just want to get it off my chest. The Lord said, go Rams. That's what the Lord said. So don't shoot the messenger. Just the, just the spokesman for y'all. All right. Uh, some of you need to maybe rearrange your schedule today. I think you ought to go to our membership class. You have uh, been thinking about... 2019 and how you might want to be a little more intentional about uh, church this year. And so you're welcome to come and hear what that looks like here at HDC this afternoon from 3 to 6. We're going to set dinner for you and uh, provide, provide that all free of charge. No child care, but uh, I think you'll learn a lot and be encouraged, be catalytic for you as you uh, kind of push forward into the new year. Those of you who have not yet attended that class. Just mark on the back of your welcome form today. Like to come. We'd still love to have you join us. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. You guys doing okay? Okay. Well, I, I just am excited because of this new series. Sermon on the Mount uh, comprises three chapters of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. We're going to be looking at this sermon over the course of 2019. We're going to fade in and out of it throughout the course of the year, so it's not like from now to the end of December, we'll just be looking at one uh, general passage, but uh, nevertheless, I think we're going to be blessed as we consider some of the words uh, that Jesus wanted us to hear. You know, everybody I meet seems to like Jesus. I actually don't meet people who don't like Jesus. They don't like me sometimes. <laughs> they don't like the church at times, but they love Jesus. And I'm glad for that. In fact, Jesus is a hero in our culture. And people uh, are into the Jesus thing, at least until they hear what he said. <laughs> and, and then they begin to wonder, like, he said that? I said, oh, yeah, man. It's important to understand what Jesus said. I believe he was right about everything. And, and this is one of the basic rules of life. You can't believe in somebody if you don't believe somebody. So when we unpack some of these uh, pretty incredible, very profound words of Jesus over the next several months. I hope you will give it every consideration. Longest recorded sermon in the Gospels, three full chapters, 107 verses long. And these chapters contain some of his best known, his least understood, and evidently some of his most forgotten words. And so we're going right to Matthew chapter 5, going to launch that uh, series, this series today. Verse 1. You with me? Are you in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1? Okay. It's on screen. You might want to follow along in your Bibles if you brought them with you. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. One word. Blessed. See, that's going to show up several times over the first uh, few verses of the sermon because it's an, important, it's an important idea. Blessed, the Greek makarios. It's an adjective that means blissful or happy. That's what the word means. It comes from the Greek word makar, which speaks of a type of happiness that's not dependent on how things are going. It was used in Greek mythology often, to describe the attitude of the gods, the, their pantheon of gods, whose, whose divine bliss was never affected by what was going on down here. Man, that's what I want, right? I want to be able to maintain a happy, joyful spirit no matter what's going on. Makar. Anybody in the house, this room maybe... The other campuses, you can even raise your hand if you're watching at home. If your name is Carrie, gals, Carrie is your name. Raise your hand. Got any Carries in the room? Okay. We got one? We got one. Don't be embarrassed. Okay, we got a couple around the room, maybe some of the other campuses. If your name is Carrie, that's you. 
That's the Scandinavian form of the Greek word makar. Your name means happiness. Maintaining that joyful, blissful outlook on life no matter what happens, circumstantially. See, now you got, you got some big shoes to fill, right? Now you got to live up to your name. You would think that people who are rich would, would be happy, or people in power, because y'all want to be rich and y'all want to be influential, so you're thinking, if I just get there, I'll be happy. Well, I, I found a great quote, a guy named Abdarma Rahman, actually the third, Muslim governor of Spain during the 8th century. It's a great quote. Let me just read part of it to you. He said, I've now reigned 50 years in victory or peace, beloved by my subjects, dreaded by my enemies, respected by my allies. Riches and honors, power and pleasure have waited on my call. In this situation, I've diligently numbered the days of pure and genuine happiness which have fallen to my lot. They amount to 14. I did the math, man. That's one happy day every three and a half years. Man, if that's all I got, that'd be a problem. A philosopher from Austria, Ludwig Wittgenstein, he said this, and I quote, I don't know why we're here, but I'm pretty sure it's not in order to enjoy ourselves. And of course, you're thinking, man, I could have written that. See, dude can't seem to find Makar. Cheryl and I just returned from the happiest place on earth. The Macarius place on earth, right? Disney World spent a week with three of our grandkids, daughter Lindsay and her family in Disney World. I, I learned three things last week at Disney World. Just want to share them with you. This is not a, a word from the Lord, nearly as binding as the one I shared with you a few minutes ago. Anyway, it's my take on Disney World. Here we go. Disney World does not make kids supremely happy. Just saying, you know? Traveling through time zones, disrupting sleeping schedules, walking mile after mile through theme park after theme park to stand in line after line, that takes its toll. So the happiest place on earth, I'm thinking, I don't know. <laughs> Number two thing I learned, because these are three granddaughters, ages two, four, and seven. Most difficult job in the world, I'm convinced, has to be a Disney theme park princess. I mean, you got to constantly smile, right? Display that expected charm and pretend. And pretend that 99% of the kids clamoring for your attention don't annoy you. <laughs> you know, I was watching the girls interact and I was thinking, what would happen if one of these princesses just snapped? <laughs> I mean, Cinderella just goes off on some family, right? Man, you better have liability insurance, Walter. <laughs> traumatize a kid for life, they'd never be able to watch a Disney movie again. You know what that is? That's pressure, bro. Pressure. Toughest job in the world, I'm convinced. Number three, this is what I learned. Money doesn't make you happy. A $30 cheeseburger doesn't taste any better than a $6 cheeseburger. <laughs> so I'm thinking rich dudes aren't any happier than I am. We're just eating cheeseburgers, so whatever. All right. We still had fun. And the reason we had fun in spite of all of that, the reason we had fun is because Cheryl and I made a strategic decision 39 years ago when we got married, and, and this is it. We will never place our faith in Walt Disney to make us happy. <laughs> Still a wise choice. Let me just ask you something, though. Why, why aren't you happy today? Why, why would you so identify with some of these comments and have to say, you know, I'm not happy? That's a very good question to ask. And it, it actually is one of many questions Jesus is going to address in this sermon. He began to teach them saying, blessed. The eight statements that he begins a sermon with are called the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude means supreme happiness because he begins every one of these eight statements with the same word. If I were to ask you a question, especially to you young people, you know, you're sitting out there and you're trying to figure out who you're going to believe and what you're going to do in life. Who are you going to trust? How big a deal Jesus is going to be to you? Let me ask you this. What do you think Jesus wants more than anything for you? And most of you would say, hey man, I think he wants me to follow his rules. It's not true. What Jesus wants for you and I more than anything, anything, is that we would be happy. 
Blessed, blessed, blessed. Makar, 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 eight times. Jesus says, I love you, bro. I just want you to be happy. I love you, girl. I just want you to be happy. If you received a phone call when you got home today, and everybody's in the room wondering, hey, who are you talking to? But they don't say anything because they don't want to be rude. And you hang up the phone. I guess you don't hang up phones anymore. Oh, whatever. <laughs> you disconnect the line, even though there's no line. I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> Standing up here thinking, I got to catch up with my techno talk. Uh, right on the back of your welcome form, how do you describe hanging up a cell phone? And then next time I teach through this, I'll get it right. All right. But anyway, get off, get off the talk, and everybody in the room sees a look on your face, and they realize whatever that person said has made you supremely happy. What would you have had to hurt here in that conversation to make everybody wonder, man, why are you so happy? Did they say you won a lot of money? Did they say, you know, you got a lottery ticket that hit? Maybe that the IRS believes you're dead? <laughs> okay. That your obnoxious neighbors just sold their house? Whatever it could have been, I'm sure it made you happy because it would have changed a problematic circumstance in your life. Either by solving a problem you were facing or creating a new narrative for you and your future that was far better than the one you've been living up until now. You know what our circumstances have? A lot of power. They hold us hostage. In fact, most of you would have to admit right now that your number one goal in this season of your life is to overcome some circumstantial problem or maybe to arrange for someone else to do that on your behalf. See, <clears throat> you're all looking to be happy. Can I just say categorically, I'm going to reflect what Jesus says. The reason you're not happy is because you're looking for happiness. And you can't find it. Happiness is not a goal, it's a reward. It's a reward, a gift, in a sense, given to us by Christ. I'm pretty sure that Edith Wharton wasn't weighing in on the theological side of this discussion when she said this, but I love this quote. If only we'd stop trying to be happy, we'd have a pretty good time. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, she was probably just saying that, you know, tongue-in-cheek a little bit. Maybe. But you know, Jesus tells the same thing. You ought to stop looking for happiness because you can't find it. You're not smart enough to find it. You're not capable of finding happiness. But this is the thing. Jesus wants to give it to you. It's not an achievement. It's a gift. Sometimes we think, wait, what's God doing? Is he trying to, is he hiding happiness? Do we have to like look under, you know, different rocks, look in different little cubbies? It's like an Easter egg hunt. And then we find it. Jesus is going to tell us over the next few weeks something I hope that we'll finally get. <laughs> Happiness is in plain sight. It's got to open your eyes, man. There are two elements embedded inside each one of these eight statements, inside each one of these, these statements we call a beatitude. Happiness is both a decision and an impression. It's a decision on the short side and an impression on the far side. See, this is the formula. You make a decision. Jesus gives you happiness or gets the ball rolling in that direction, at the very least, and then people are impressed with that. You know, we elevate all the time our core strategy here at HDC, and that's that people sitting on the front row of our lives would get an accurate depiction of who Jesus is. See, this is, the, this, is, this is so great because Jesus wants them to see him. And when we make the right decision, then Jesus rewards us with happiness and then people are impressed. You know, it's all about impact, right? 
Happiness is like a meteor. When it hits, it makes an impression. Your life is different. And and other people's perception of Jesus and you are different. So make good decisions. Okay, so we're just going to give you two today. I'm going to break this up over the next several weekends. And we're going to talk about hope and humility. Let's start with hope. Fill in some blanks. Hope happens when you trust Jesus alone to make you happy. How are we going to get the ball rolling here toward happiness? Well, just trust Jesus only. Blessed are the poor in spirit, he said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see that? Let's read that out loud together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to personally thank Both of you for saying that out loud. Whoever you were, it was music to my ears. Now what I would like is for the rest of y'all to join in and say it with a little more conviction. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay. I love this stuff because it's like Jesus is saying, welcome to my kingdom. Not welcome to my kingdom, but welcome to my kingdom. See, it's it's in his kingdom where people find happiness because Jesus provides it. He gives it. And there's a decision there, see. The decision is to cast your entire lot with Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is a choice you make. I'm going to be poor in spirit. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's an impression. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is the impression. People look at us and they think, man, what do they got? Why do they have what I can't find? What's the answer? Because you all couldn't find it either. That's why. But Jesus gave it to you. Most of the non-believers you personally know are happy for you that you found Jesus. They're happy for you. Have you heard that? I've heard that. Oh, I've heard that a lot. It's not the road I chose, Tom, but I'm glad it works for you. I'm happy for you. See, they still think that they can find exactly what I have by walking a different path that doesn't include Jesus. Jesus is just one way to live your life and discover happiness. And they think they can find it another way. And then we feed, you and I, as Christians, even Christians, we feed that misconception simply by making Jesus an addition to our lives rather than making Jesus our lives. See, people will never see heaven in your life if you're still looking to the world for happiness. Just a few chapters earlier, John the Baptist shows up And it says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, in those days John the Baptist came and he's preaching in the wilderness of Judea around Jerusalem and he says to the people, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, straight paths for him. Okay, you want to find happiness? Then here you go. Make a straight line path to Jesus. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 bucks. That's what Isaiah the prophet told the Jewish people hundreds of years earlier. And that's what John the prophet emphasizes when he quotes Isaiah's words. Do whatever it takes to make a straight path between Jesus and you. People tell me all the time, man, I wish I would have given my heart to Jesus sooner. Some of you would give that testimony to us right now. Say, man, if I'd only figured this out sooner, if I wouldn't have taken the long path, the long way around. And my response is, yeah, no kidding. Now you know you should never have put that decision off. Now you know you should have taken a straighter path. How different your life would have been. How different your legacy had you gotten this figured out earlier? 
But then this is the thing. After we come to Christ, we, we don't take our own good advice. We make the same mistake. We take roads that end up, once again, being the long way around, the shorter and simpler path to growing in our faith. For example, you've given your heart to Christ, right? In fact, I'm going to ask you, in all of, all of these rooms, at all of our campuses here in Victorville, raise your hand if you've given your heart to Christ. Real high. Okay, that's great. Put them down. I'm pretty sure that's not too intrusive a question to ask a group like this on a weekend. But I could ask all of those people who just raised their hands, and don't raise your hand now because I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But I could ask you all this question, were you publicly baptized in water after you gave your life to Christ? And I'd see far fewer hands go up. I just wonder why. Why haven't you been baptized? The Bible says to be baptized in water is the first step of growth after you receive Christ in order to demonstrate to the people sitting on the front row of your life that you are now simply trusting Jesus only to make you happy. That's what baptism is. And then you would invite your oikos to church to witness your baptism, and now they're not only sitting on the front row of your life, they're sitting on the front row of church. Some of you simply need to look into your program, figure out when the next baptism class on your campus is, And then say to yourself, man, I need to start taking shorter paths here. What are you waiting for? A long way. I could say the same thing about getting in a small group. I could say the same thing about uh, serving in the church. I could say the same thing about getting advice from a mentor, finally going to see that counselor. We make things so much more complicated by simply putting off doing what we know is good for us. You know, I've told you forever, well, not really forever, but for over three decades. See, it's not that you should go to the class or go to the group or go see the counselor. That's not the question. Why why don't you go? The question is this. What are you going to do instead? What's more important than that? The, uh, The brutal fact is you're evidencing You're not all in. And then Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? We got that verse, those verses down because there are life verses. Some of us have have claimed these as our life verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in half of your ways. Every once in a while... Or does it say, in all your way, all, 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 submit to him. And what will he do? He'll make your path straight. Isn't that funny? You make a straight path between you and Jesus, and he makes a straight path between you and everything else you need. Jesus is into straight paths because he invented geometry. I'm sorry, high school students. Jesus invented geometry, and he knows something. The shortest distance between two points is a straight path. Why are you making this so much harder than it needs to be? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually describes this as a decision to be impoverished, to be poor. But he's not talking about material provision. He's not talking about material wealth. If it was wealth that made us happy, then generosity would be a vice. Why would you want to give something to somebody else? It'd be unfair to give to someone in need because any material gain would lead to their unhappiness. He's not talking about money here. The Greek word penace, it refers to poor people who earn such a low wage that they could barely make ends meet. Some of you say, yeah, bro, that's me. I'm penace. Funny thing is, in this verse, that's not the word Jesus used. The Greek word Jesus chose here is takas. And it describes people who are completely dependent on others for survival. They're out of options. They have nowhere else to go. What's Jesus trying to tell us today? You want happiness? You've got nowhere else to go but me.
the beggars, the crippled, the deaf, the lame, the blind, anybody who was out of options. You know who they were? The Takas. Max Lucado, pastor, author, he describes them this way. Their cupboards are bare, their pockets are empty, their options are gone. They've long since stopped demanding justice, man. They're pleading for mercy. They don't brag, they beg. You know what Jesus said about those people? Happy are they. Seriously? You know, the Sermon on the Mount is completely countercultural. You can follow the culture if you want, but do you see happiness out there? You can believe the line in the world if you want, but is there any hope? Jesus is telling us that happiness will never be given to control freaks, which probably describes all of us at times. This challenge was clearly intended for the Jewish people. They had, they had seen and experienced what they believed to be injustice. For 700 years, they've lived in subjection to foreign powers. They longed for the day when the tables would be turned and the Romans would no longer be served by them, but the day when the Romans would actually be serving them. Yeah, that's what they wanted. The kingdom they sought was political. They wanted to take back power. They wanted to control their own destiny. We all do, actually. But Jesus said, you, you won't restore order by taking power. And by the way, you could ask congressional Democrats if that's true or not. Christianity is only for those who realize they don't have the power to get what they want. You don't have the power to get happiness. You can try to get it, but you'll never find it anywhere else. You don't deserve happiness because you're a sinner, as am I. You have, you have no ability, no power to dictate happiness. You can't buy happiness. I mean, Paul McCartney told us that. You certainly can't earn happiness. There's one place you find it, Jesus said. And when you realize that you're out of every other option, blessed are the poor in spirit. Every option the world proposes for happiness, it leads to the world exposes about happiness. <laughs> the world can offer nothing but more of the same sense of emptiness. And that's the thing about your 8 to 15. That's the thing about your oikos. It's the thing about those people sitting on the front row of y'all's lives. What do they have to look forward to today? Without Jesus. Jesus can hardly wait to give them the same gift he's given you. That's why we, that's why we, work, the, we work the problem. That's why we list. That's why we pray. That's why we invest. That's why we invite. That's why we prepare. You know, the first statement in the sermon, it organically leads into the next one. The impression that people have about Christians is that we think we're better than other people. They do. People out there think we're arrogant. And the problem is some of us do think we're arrogant because we found Jesus and those poor slobs haven't yet. Pride is not the attitude that should reflect a believer. Finding Jesus should never lead us into an attitude of superiority, but to one of gratitude and great humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says this in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Again, this is so counterculture. Comfort in our society comes out of celebration, not mourning. But here's my second point. It's not just about hope. It's also about humility. And I will tell you this right now, right off the bat. <laughs> humility and hope are inextricably connected. You know why the world has such little hope? Because there's such little humility. 
And I don't care what side of the aisle you're sitting on, man. These people don't get that. Humility happens when you're clear about your reality. You know, people at times, they say, Pastor Tom, I appreciate that sense of humility in your life. I will tell you this. <laughs> humility. <laughs> I wish I could generate more humility. I, I'm just saying, humility happens when you see life for what it is. The reason that I can feel humble is because I know who I am outside of Christ. And I mourn that. I mourn who I am. I don't feel better than non-Christians. I just feel grateful. Because I'm pretty clear about my reality. Here's the decision. I'll try to make this as practical as I can. Stop blaming others for all your problems. I stopped doing that a long time ago. You know, you know why I stopped blaming them? Because I realize what the problem is here. It's me. And I mourn that. And, and this is the impression. See, once again, I make a decision. Then this happiness that Jesus gives. This is such a load lifted. Some of you just blame people. It's the first thing you think of. You gotta blame her, gotta blame him, gotta blame them. It's a teacher's fault, it's a coach's fault, it's my kid's fault, it's my spouse's fault, it's a pastor's fault, it's Republican's fault, it's a Democrat's fault, it's Washington's fault, Sacramento's fault. I guess as long as you're pointing the finger at others, you won't recognize whose fault it is. But then, when you do, it's like there's this burden lifted. I don't have to look for people to blame anymore. I mean, who am I going to blame today? And then this is the impression. When that burden is lifted, then the world gets this impression. There's something magical about grace. Welcome to the magic kingdom. Because grace is amazing. And as long as you're blaming people, you'll never experience. And Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Because they see what's going on there. The injustice we experience in life is not because of the unrighteous acts of others. The fact that unrighteousness now is triumphing over righteousness. We, we are unrighteous. John Stott, this is what he said about mourning. He said, uh, the, those here promised comfort are not those who mourn the loss of a loved one. Because that's what we think of, you know, I'm grieving or I'm mourning. This is not about grieving the loss of a loved one who has moved or passed but those who mourn the loss of their innocence, their righteousness, and their self-respect. I mourn that. So many of our difficulties, yours, mine, whether they're financial difficulties or relational difficulties or spiritual difficulties, they're not because somebody treated us unfairly. It does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But so many of them are not because of them. It's because of the law of the harvest. We reap what we sow. See, it's one thing to be spiritually poor. It's yet another thing to recognize and be clear about how you got there. It's not natural for us. We look at the wretchedness of the world around us and we ignore our own failures. We'd rather scream about the no-call for pass interference in the closing minutes of a playoff game. We'd rather do that than look at all the bad coaching decisions that happened for three quarters or the passes that were intercepted for three quarters, mistakes that we made that put us in a position to need a call even in the last minute of the game, even if it would have been the right call. We only want to scream about the mistakes someone else made. And I don't say that because I'm a Rams fan. Because they got a lot of making up to do for 
observing me 23 years ago and moving to St. Louis, I'm just saying. <laughs> but winning a Super Bowl would go a long way to restoring our relationship. I heard this week that the NFL is investigating a prospective first-round draft pick, a kid named Drew Locke out of the University of Missouri. And they're, they're trying to figure out, should a team draft him? And you know what they're looking at? The fact that he cheated on a math test in the ninth grade. The NFL is investigating him. He said in his own defense, he could still only pull a C-plus on the test. <laughs> it's a great sense of humor. Remember what the Apostle Paul said about his own life? What a wretched man I am. Uh, you remember the time he took all of his own righteousness and flushed, flushed it? Talked about this even a couple of weeks ago in Philippians 3. What's more, he said, verse 8, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. He is all in. That is a straight path. I consider my own righteousness, scubalon, garbage, that I may gain Christ. You know, God brings comfort to people who recognize they're bankrupt without him. <laughs> you know, when God created the world, he began with light. Remember that? I know you weren't there. I was not there either sometimes, you might think. How old is Pastor Tom? I was not there in the beginning. <laughs> But at the very beginning, I'm 64, by the way. Uh, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. His first words. I always find interest in that. And why light? Well, what he's trying to send is a very clear signal that he wants to be known. Let's be very clear about who I am, God said. I'm a powerful God. I'm a loving God. I'm an extremely predictable God. And then Adam turned off the lights by sinning. And his sin needed to be what? In Jesus' words, mourned. But it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, so they sinned, Adam and Eve sinned. And the eyes of them both were open. They realized they were naked. They'd always been naked. What's going on here? But they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord coming, walking in the garden, cool of the day. Here he comes, got to hide. And so they hide in the bushes, hide in the trees. And the Lord God calls to the man, Yoo-hoo, where, where are you? And Adam answered, I heard you were in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, well, woman, you put here with me. She gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Let me ask you, how do you face your own failures, your own sin? How do you deal with your own stuff? Do you minimize it? Like they did, they covered themselves. You know, my sin isn't that bad, I can fix it with a little thread and some fig leaves. You know what that is? That's religion right there. We got ourselves into this mess and we're gonna get ourselves out. Maybe you don't minimize it. Maybe you hide it just like they did. They try to hide their, watch this, their newfound reality. They tried to hide from God. Good luck with that, man. And then they blamed others for it. For Adam, who, who is Adam going to blame for his failure? Okay, it's a short list. It's like one. I'm sorry. This is not a gender thing. Um, I, he, he will figure that out at some point, but at this point, I think it's just he's got nobody else to blame except himself. Or are you going to own it? 
know what Jesus said? Blessed are those who what? Own it. Who mourn. For they will be comforted. You look in the mirror of Scripture and you humbly recognize that you can't find comfort outside of embracing the gift of God's forgiveness. You know what grace is? It's magic. It's a burden lifted. It's clarity. It's freedom. And you never find it by minimizing and hiding and blaming. James said, anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says, like someone who looks in the, their face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, oh, some of us at least all wish we could forget what we look like. <laughs> you know what the Bible is? It's a mirror. That's why we don't read it. You know, people say, I can't find time to read the Bible. I know what's going on here. It has nothing to do with time. You're just not wanting to be any more clear about your reality. You know, from the very beginning of human history, sin sucked humility out of our hearts and at the same time sucked hope out of the world. That's what sin does. It sucks. And Jesus comes along. And he gives notice that both are available to us once again. He says, welcome to my kingdom. You know, we're going to pick this up again. That's great. I mean, yeah. I can feel, I can feel it. But I got to tell you, we'll pick this up again next time. But I I just want to leave you with this. Maybe there's a little homework. You want some hope for your marriage? Try a little humility. Because you know what that'll do? That'll like make an impression is what that'll do. Because that's the beginning of happiness. Father, give us a great week. Help us to remember uh, even some of these directives. There are some in the rooms today who have not gone all in with you. They're still making all these roundabout whatever excuses. I just pray for straight paths for our future. If there's anyone in any of these rooms today who have not given their heart to Christ, here's a straight path idea. Admit that you're a sinner. More than that, instead of blaming and excusing and minimizing and hiding, I mean, what are you doing here? I mean, what Jesus brought you here for, why Jesus caused you to log on to the service today is so that you could be clear about your reality. And now you need to make a straight path to Jesus. Admit that. Then believe that Jesus can make you happy. Believe that Jesus can save you from you. And choose to place your life all in. Give Jesus your life. Just watch what he does with you. Watch. Best decision you'll ever make. There's hope for you. Straight path to Jesus. And let's stop blaming people, guys. Let's start owning our stuff, looking in the mirror, and showing some humility. In the great name of Jesus, all God's children said, amen.